talk about today is we're starting a new series called In Your Face. And the idea is basically, I want to talk to you a little bit about biblical confrontation. Okay? Biblical confrontation. To start, first of all, I am a nerd. Um, I don't, I know. Uh, I don't know if you can tell that from the everything about me, but I, you know, I revel in it. I'm in deep. And so because of that, uh, I do not follow sports. I don't keep up with the stats. I don't follow the teams or who's playing or what, none of it. I mean, unless you want to talk about Quidditch, I don't have anything to share with you. Um, It's a Harry Potter thing. So what the staff tells me, Pastor Steve, Pastor Jose, and Pastor Tim, what they tell me is, and spoiler alert, I think they're full of crap, they say, but Barry, you need to follow sports, because wherever you go, whoever you talk to, even if it's a complete stranger, if you follow sports, you can start a conversation, to which I say, don't you mean argument? I've seen some of these exchanges. They're not really filled with a whole lot of brotherly love. And I just, I don't see the point. And I've been in a couple of these conversations, against my will, about sports. <laughs> One time, I took Angie to go see a brand new doctor. We've never seen this guy before. And he comes in, and he's wearing a coat, and it's got a big sports A on it. I don't know which team. Uh, And so I venture a guess, and I go, so do you follow Auburn? To which he said, no. Well, sensing I had crossed a line, I said, well, you know, the the only reason I ask is because my father rooted for Auburn. To which he says, your father was wrong. (laughs) A human being said that to me. After knowing him for 11 seconds, great conversation. So I, and I just came back with, well, just so you know, my father was wrong about a lot of things. You're late to the party. And for some reason, that snapped him out of it. He was like, oh, I'm a doctor. I should help people or something. And so he just kind of (laughs) moved back into, you know, helping my wife. Uh, And it's just, it's amazing to me the kinds of things that we confront each other on. Just, I have an opinion, and I must broadcast this to the universe. It's just this constant, and it's getting worse. If you look at the world around you, many of the methods and the reasons that the world has for confrontation is just wrong. Much, 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 much of the world's methods and reasons for confrontation is just plain wrong. And it's crazy. And we're getting more and more and more assertive about things for the wrong reasons. I think part of it, there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, we live in an age where you can rate anything. You can rate anything. Restaurants, dishes, movies, music, uh, a moment captured on video, a decision made by the government, organization. It just doesn't matter. And not all of this needs to be, not every, and this is kind of a mixed blessing kind of thing. Some things need ratings, like toilet paper, you know. Yeah, don't get this kind. The, um, and some things do not. I'll never forget, there was a YouTube video, quick plot summary, a woman Her brother has died. He is an organ donor. A man who needs the heart gets it, and she goes and visits him. She takes a stethoscope with her so that she can listen to her brother's heartbeat. Close to six million people watched this video. Millions of people watched the video. Of them, about a thousand of them said, thumbs down. Yeah, who are these people? Who are these thousand people that just, you know, how did they think the video was going to end? You know, just, did she think she was going to try and take it back? You know, just give me that. I don't know what they're thinking. 
And we don't, need to, I, we don't need a rating for every single thing. But because we have an opinion in here, express your opinion, everybody's expressing their opinions on things that we don't need opinions expressed about. And the other thing that's going on is this. It used to be, when you turned on the news, they would say, this is the scariest thing happening today and why you should be afraid. Now, if you turn on the news or you turn on social media, it's, here's the scary things going on, and here's why you should be offended. Have you noticed that? Here's why you should be offended. Here's what the white people are doing. Here's what the black people are doing. Here's what the Democrats are doing. Here's what the Republicans are doing, and you need to be offended. Here's what this people group is doing. Here's what the organizations are doing. Here's what the banks are doing. Here's what the most important one we have to know every day. Here's what Trump did every day. Every day. He coughed and didn't say, excuse me, impeach. It's just constant. It's just constant. And I don't want to know what his last tweet was. I just don't care anymore. And there's this constant need to just confront over things that we don't need to be confronting each other over. And what I want to take a look at is biblical confrontation and how it stands in stark contrast to many of the ways that the world confronts. And a big part of this is uh, Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen, where it talks about how as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. In other words, the focus is on the benefit of the person you're talking to. The benefit is on the person that you're talking to. It's not about expressing your own politics. It's not about winning an argument. It's not about, hey, I had a random opinion. I need to broadcast it. It's how do I help? How do I offer help to this other person? And this is more of an art than a science. I can't give you a five-step program for confrontation in any situation. It's not going to work that way. We're going to be talking about this over the next few weeks. But um, I can tell you this. For biblical confrontation to work, you have got to change your priorities. The priority is not you and you being right. The priority is assisting the person that you're talking to. Period. Uh, a great verse that talks about this is 2 Timothy 4 2. 2 Timothy 4 2. And let me go ahead and take a moment now and just mention that, uh, first of all, our, our internet isn't uh, doing that great right now. Uh, and so I apologize for that. But if it does kick back on, uh, we have a link that you can go to, and my notes are in there. Okay. Um, but this is Paul speaking to Timothy, and he says this. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. I want to break that down real quick. First of all, preach the word. In other words, you're not the authority. You're not the authority. Sorry. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. I have to burst that bubble with me every now and again too. I'm not the authority. God's the authority. And it says, be prepared in season, whether the time is favorable or not. Meaning, know what you're doing. Know what it is that you're doing. Know whether or not this is a situation you should be speaking into. And then it says, patiently correct and rebuke. Patiently. Patiently with teaching, which means we offer, we remind, we gently encourage. Is there confrontation? Yes. Is there correction? Yes. But it must be patient, it must be offered, and it must have an, uh, an, an air of teaching. And it says, encourage your people. Some translations say exhort. 
We are to encourage, lift up, and help the other person. Not beat down, look down upon, or act superior. That's biblical confrontation. And already you can see how it stands in stark contrast to many of the things that the world is doing. So what I want to talk to you about is basically what are, what are some of the things as we, take, as we take a look at this verse, what are some of the things that we need to, do, to be when we confront? To confront others first, be prepared. You need to be prepared. Okay? Um, give me a moment to get to my bookmark here. Um, here is Jesus, and he's talking to many, many people. And he says this. Uh, Matthew verse 7, starting at verse 3. He says, And why worry about the speck in your friend's eye? When you have a log in your own, how can you think of saying to your friend, Let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye? When you can't see past the log in your own eye. Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So there's several things here that are really important. The first thing is this. You need to be very self-aware of where you are in your walk with God before you start telling other people what they should do. In other words, who are you evaluating more? Yourself or other people, because it needs to be yourself. You need to be constantly looking at your walk and making sure that you are in a place, depending on what you are talking about, that you are in a place to address that issue. Because here's the really radical thing, guys and ladies. Just because you're a Christian does not give you an automatic license to tell other people how to live their lives. We've met that person, have we not? They show them on the news all the time. I'm a Christian, so I get to boss everyone around. And it's infuriating. And that's the image that people have of Christians. Because that's the image that many of them portray. Just because you're a Christian does not mean that you get to tell other people how to live. You have to... You you have to earn a place at the table of confrontation, depending on what the subject is. Here's a situation. Just yesterday at Jitterbugs. Just yesterday at Jitterbugs. Less than 24 hours. Uh, I overheard a conversation between two ladies. And they were discussing the idea that all religions are exactly the same. They're all worshiping the same God. They're all roughly doing the same thing. Um, you know, whether it's Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism. Uh, they, you know, they all... They're all doing the same thing. Of course, the problem is, if you talk to a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Christian, they'll tell you, "Mm, nope, Uh, no, it is not. And very often, when I have a conversation with people about this, I go, yeah, all religions are exactly the same, except for their belief about God, heaven, hell, sin, and salvation. Aside from those, they're all exactly the same. Uh, I did not tell, and, and fear had nothing to do with it. I've, I've had this conversation before. I know what to say. I had my little pocket of answers ready to go. I did not speak to them about it. I did not say a thing. Because I don't know really at all either one of these women. And if I had gone over there, it would have been just another example of, oh, I have to make the world right with my opinions. And it would have been rejected immediately. I had not earned a place to talk to them. And very often, the idea of being prepared, going back to what it says in Timothy, be prepared, is 
taking, 95% of the time, it's just stopping for a moment and shutting our mouths and asking, should I say anything? Now, what I'm not saying is that we should always be quiet. That is not what I'm saying here. You notice at the end of what Jesus says in this passage, he says, remove the log from your own eye, then you can remove the speck from the other person's eye. Then you can do that. He's not saying stop removing specks. He's saying make sure that you are in a place where you can do that. We have to ask ourselves, have I even earned the right? And so this is, this is more than just knowing the right answers, which we need to do. We need to know, okay, here's the, here's the question that people ask. How do I address that? Here's what that person is going through. How do I address that? But we have to earn the right in this day and age to go up and talk to people a lot of times. Now, I've gone up to complete strangers and I've heard that they've just moved to the area. I hear them over talking in the coffee shop. I go, oh, you just moved to the area. If you don't mind, I go to this church. If you're looking for one, come see us. Here's our website. Check us out online. And then I walk away. And that's it. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying be quiet all the time. I'm saying know the situation and your place in it. Okay? All right. Be prepared. To confront others, we also have to do this. We have to be encouraging. We have to be encouraging. There was a, the Washington Post put out an article not too long ago. Uh, and basically the title of the article was this. I got pregnant, I chose to keep my baby, and my Christian school humiliated me. And what happened was uh, she was an honor student, uh, involved in several leadership things uh, in this school, got pregnant, and basically the school kind of swept in and just as a, I, and I hope you'll go check out the article, uh, you know, her parents were very supportive. They knew she had made a mistake and also knew that she had done the right thing by deciding that she's going to keep the child. The school saw things a little bit differently. Uh, they suspended her, removed her from all of her leadership positions, which is the one thing that they did that I agree with, but suspending her, why? Uh, they weren't going to let her walk at graduation. Why? I mean, there was just, and then of course there's all of the side glances and the stink eye and all of the things that people say in such a situation. Uh, they came back in and they, she didn't get suspended. She was going to be able to graduate now, uh, but they still wouldn't let her walk at graduation. And I'm sure I'm looking at a room full of opinions on this subject. But the thing is this. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it says this. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. See, here's, here's the question I hear over and over and over again. In a multitude of situations... If we show, okay, here's this person, they're living a life that the Bible says is wrong, okay? They're making decisions that the Bible says is wrong. If we show encouragement or inclusion to this person, are we not saying that we agree with the decisions that they've made? If we let them in the church, if I let them in my house, if I sit down and talk with them, if we let them get baptized, if we let them get involved in a ministry, are we not saying that we agree with what they're doing? And the first thing is that a lot of that is a covering of our own backside. I'm with this person, and I'm afraid of what other people are going to say. That's where a lot of that comes from. Let's be very honest. And the other thing that we need to know about that situation is that Jesus did it all the time. All the time. All the time. In Jesus' day, if I were to sit down and, and you and I were to sit down and have a meal together, 
okay? This is in Jesus' day. If we sit down and have a meal together, that means I accept you. That means that everything between you and me is okay. We're okay. Okay? Y'all get what I'm saying? And what did the Pharisees say about Jesus? He sits down and eats with tax collectors and prostitutes. He's accepting them. That's the title they put on Jesus. And he wore it as a badge of pride. He said, yeah. That's, yes. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And he did not give a rip about other people's interpretation of what he did. He didn't follow the tax collectors with a protest sign. He sat down with them and ate with them and accepted them. He did not accept their sin. And if you read through Scripture, you'll see there are times where he says, you need to stop doing this or bad things are going to happen. He was very blunt about that situation. But a lot of this is just, it's just self-preservation for silly reasons. We are supposed to be encouraging. We're supposed to encourage others. You know, it reminds me of... Uh, I, I, okay, quick story. So... I'll never forget, because people come to me all the time. They go, Pastor Barry, you don't know what I've done. I can't go to church. And I laugh and laugh and laugh, because I'll never forget, there's a situation where there were several of us standing around, and one of them was a person who has had a very long history of drug use, okay? Been coming to church here for a very long time, and... Drugs came into the conversation, and the experienced one said, you know, I've never done quaaludes. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, I have. I don't even know why I said that. And if you think I didn't bend over in hysterics laughing, you are wrong. When you do so many drugs, I'm not a doctor, but when you've done so many drugs that you kill the part of the brain that keeps track of the drugs that you've done, you've done a lot of drugs. And yes, we let him come here. And he does things, the um, good things. And so, <laughs> you know, I just, because that's what church is. We're supposed to allow people in here. And we... Do not get wrapped up in this whole idea of what will people think. If you want to reach people, if you want to help people, if you want to further God's kingdom, you have got to be encouraging. Okay? You're going to hear swear words. You're going to hear bad decisions. You're going to hear mixed thinking. And you need to help that person without giving them a stink eye, without you need to be, we need to be encouraging. Because we are the church. Okay, all right. The last thing is this. Um, be patient. Be patient. If you're going to confront others, you are going to need to be patient. Uh, Ephesians 4.2 says this, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Again, does this not stand in stark contrast to much of what we see in the world today? You don't need to be a theologian to see the point of this verse. And I'll never forget, this reminded me of this guy that I used to go and talk to. Uh, he worked at Walmart in Spring Lake, and he was a conspiracy theorist. Um, big, big time conspiracy theorist. Uh, I love conspiracy theorists because they believe they really know what's going on, man, and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, you know, he was the one that was just like, you know, the Illuminati, they're trying to microchip the babies. And, you know, I mean, it was just crazy, these conversations that we would have. And I would go and I would talk to him and, and I would listen. Who he could talk. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, I so wish I had recorded just one conversation. But 
he would talk about all of this, his things. And anything organized, banks, organizations, uh, religion, it didn't matter. They were up to something, and he knew what it was. And I would stop him every now and again, and when I could sort of get a few words in edgewise, and I would say, have you thought about this? Have you, have you considered, you know, here's a book that, that, that addresses what you've just said. You know, you know, let me send you the link. Uh, here's an article that, that talks about that from a different perspective that you just might enjoy. Uh, and, and let me tell you, he did a lot more talking than I did. Volumes more. And I had to really bite my lip a lot. Uh, and so, and did, you know, is there a happy ending to the story? Did he fall to his knees and accept Christ in the middle of the produce section? No. Um, but I gave him some things to think about, and I just, and I was patient, and I got a lot farther with him than if I had just rolled my eyes and walked away, or if I had just yelled at him for his thoughts, or if I had just, you know, many of the things that we do when we respond to things that we don't like. You have we have got to be patient. And I'm, I'm reminding myself of this just as much as anybody else. And if we're not, if we come across as dismissive or angry, we're going to lose them. At my last church, this was years ago, I'll never forget, and I have no idea why he admitted this to me. This guy comes for, the, for church. He's got his daughter with him. It's his first Sunday, and so I said, hey, how are you? Names, uh, are you military? Yes, and I saw him just as a daughter, and I said, so are you married or have a girlfriend? Or, and he said, and I quote, well, I have a wife and a girlfriend. Now, it's very hard when somebody says something like that to not do this. But let me tell you, that's all it took. I never saw him again. Because what, what is that? Judgment. Uh, I don't know what I was supposed to do, but the, uh, I still go, to, all right, if I had done it differently, what would have, you know, just, you know, I don't know what I would have done. But I just, I'll, I'll never forget it. But with one, not a single word, just one set of eyebrows, I sent him packing and never saw him again. It's, it's very easy for us to, to come across as dismissive. We, we, we have to internalize this idea. We have, to, we have to say, I'm going to be patient. And we have to really hold on to that because it's very easy to just send them in another direction. He came to church for a reason that day. And, it, and in an instant, I undermined it. I dismissed him and his reason for being there. Um, and I never got a chance to do the very thing that I should have, which is know his story. I didn't get a chance to know his story. Here's, here's something that will help and help all of us. It is very hard to criticize somebody when you know their story. For all I know, he was in the middle of a divorce from a woman who was... Uh, the most horrible human being that the planet has ever produced. Uh, I don't know. I'll never will know. I didn't get a chance to know his story. And part of that patience that we need, you will gain when you just simply ask, if you don't mind me asking, what, what led you here? How, how, did you get, how did you get from there to there? And every single time, again, you won't always agree with the decisions that they made, definitely. Definitely. But you will go, oh. Because very often, the reason we're not in the situation that they're in is because we were not put in the situation to begin with that they were first put in. We have got to be patient. And knowing their story will go a long way in helping us with that. Um, I tell people all the time that more and more the church is becoming like a car alarm. Um, 
Y'all have heard car alarms go off, right? And did you rush to their aid? No. We all hear a car alarm and we go, oh, is that mine? No? Okay. And we're done. That was it. That's the entire, we don't go, what's wrong, citizen? And then run over. (laughs) Ever. We never do that. And we're not even guilty about it. It's not like we go, well, there was this one time I heard a car alarm and I did nothing. We don't care. I just, let, and if you steal cars as a job and the alarm goes off, let me tell you, you're safe. Just keep working. Uh, I, just, I really hope there's kids in here without their parents so they can go home and say, I learned that when stealing cars. So, uh, okay, sermon. So, We're becoming like these car alarms, just noise that no one responds to ever. And let me tell you something. If if you want to get people's attention, if you really want to stand out in a crowd, in a world of noise and arrogance, be patient Be encouraging and be prepared. If you are those things, people will listen to you. You will be able to confront confront people in a way that is helpful. Now, I know there's a swirl of questions, and we're going to talk about those in the next few weeks. Next week, we're going to show you one more video, just one more, I promise. And then after that, we'll continue this series. But I need you to know that, that the very basis is that our priority must be the other person not being right. Our priority must be on, on helping that other individual and not sounding better than we are. Our priority needs to be, what does God want this person to know not what do I want them to know. And, we, and if you are that way, if you are, and even if somebody asks you a question, I mean, they just come right out, and you don't have an answer, just say, you know what, I don't know. Let me talk to some people, and I'll, and I'll get back to you. That is a valid response. But we have to do it lovingly and encouragingly and patiently. You'll notice in all of these verses, it doesn't say, get a sign, a big piece of cardboard, write your feelings on it, and wave it around. That's not in here. Nowhere. Uh, it's, 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 it's one-on-one. It's individual to individual. It's, it's loving and patient. It's teaching. Uh. And one of the things that I would, I would just I would ask you to, to prayerfully consider is this. First, you know, is, is there something in here that, that I need to walk away with that I really need to take time to take a look at and just say, okay, am I, is there something I need to fix? And then the other thing is this, because at no point does Jesus say, be silent all the time. The other question that you may want to ask is, who is it? that is in my life that God has put there for a reason so that I may speak to them. We hear the word confront and we just, we just get this idea of a, of a red-faced, you know, just, uh, that's not it. It's, it's simply, it's, it's encouragement. It's, it's help. It's, have you looked at it from this point of view? Is there somebody who is is who they trust you they would be willing to listen to you say these things who is who are the people that God has put into your life that you may be able to speak to and here's the thing a lot of times this exhortation this this correction is nothing more than a a tap on the shoulder the reason we tell you about the five steps every week is because we want you to be involved in that but we also want you to invite other people through that process it may be something as simple as, like I said earlier, hey, I'm in a connection group. I know you're not. Would you like to join me sometime? 
Sometimes it's that low key. So, so simply, prayerfully consider what are some things that maybe I need to adopt, but even more importantly, who is someone that God has put into my life that, I, that, that he wants me to, to talk to? Um, in closing, I want to I remind you that uh, I want to go ahead and ask the, uh, the worship team to, to come on back up. In closing, I want to remind you that we have our, our blue bag ministry. Um, if you're ready to begin that relationship with Jesus Christ, and it's something that uh, you've been thinking about for a while, uh, we have our blue bags. There's some. You can see them. There he is. Thanks, buddy. I didn't have one on the table. Uh, there's some at each corner of the stage there. We have them all in the back uh, bookshelves as well. Uh, don't leave until somebody talks to you. Uh, and they'll take seven or eight minutes just to explain very simply what it means to accept Christ as your Savior, to be a follower of Christ. We also have our two communion stations. There's one in the back in the front. And uh, if you want to take communion, we have our cross over here if you'd like to spend some time in prayer and people that will pray with you should you choose. Uh, just ask them and, uh, and they'll be happy to pray with you. And lastly, uh, if you want some more information about getting involved in some of those steps, we have someone that will talk to you as you go into the tent building. Uh, you'll see somebody standing there at the bottom of the steps. Just take a left there and they'll take you in and they'll talk to you about what it means uh, to, to get involved a little bit more into the church. But what is it? Because we all have people in our lives. And I think they're there for a reason. Who is it that God has allowed into your life that you can speak to? Because we are not supposed to just keep to ourselves. We're not supposed to be loud and brash and arrogant. But we're not supposed to remain silent either. We are to help. We are to exhort. We are to encourage patiently and with teaching. Who is that person that God may be leading you to speak to?